in the wrong. We've just, just discussed this uh, just a second ago. So, continuing to September then, guys. Uh, even more feedback. Um, true successor to Wanted Monty Mole, another devious platformer. Monty on the run. It struck an early code with reviewers, and then another crash sma smash, and another zap sizzler. I don't think I know all these names. Um, what the Freedom Key? Have you seen, just seen that on here? Look. That. Just been selected on there, probably early in the video. So the Freedom Key is one particular feature that Peter used on Monty on the run, allowing you to select five objects at the start of the game from a pool of 20. Some are completely useless. And if you choose badly, you won't be able to progress later in the game. How cruel was that? What's the idea behind that? Come on. I'm just extremely cruel. <laughs> <laughs> You're sitting there in, in your office going, Whoa. I just wanted someone to get almost to the end and go, why is this wall not gone away? Oh, of course I'm dying right. I'll have to restart. Oh. That's just a boo. Can we get a boo hiss from the audience here? <laughs> You want to replay that, yeah? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Restart from about 40 seconds ago from where you last were. Beautiful game. I think we've got this one actually running on one of the, uh, the uh, one of the systems in the in the hall. So if you want to check that out later on, guys, then uh, feel free. Plus, I wanted to give the magazine something to print. <laughs> yes. So you get something else on there. There's nothing else behind it. Uh, do you ever do anything like that on any, any of your other games since then, or was it? No, it was a bad idea, really. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. At least you admit it now. <laughs> That's the main thing. Okay. Uh, oh, there's Monty on the run again. There's a Commodore 64 version. Who remembers that one? Um, so, micro projects are again on hand for this one, under the watchful eye of Peter, to, come, to provide conversion duties. We've Rob again providing the soundtrack, which to this day is still revered as one of the best piece, pieces of synth music ever. Check it out! I think that's what's sort of like this one I want to the line, I think they're asking for a burger. There you go. I mean, Pete! Mind, I must understand a little bit. There you go. So, just for the audience. I mean, we are a little miffed that the C64 version was given a better, slightly better asset back at the time. No, I think we all would have done with it. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's just a high game with uh, a little bit better music. It's yeah. a little bit better. <laughs> it beeped a lot. <laughs> it beeped a lot. So it was absolutely fine, it was just like a collaboration, you weren't bothered with it. Yeah, well, you know, you weren't like... The, the fact that everyone thought that because of the music, the C64 version was better, there was no... What it did do was it made me want to do the next one version. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, unlike once, where uh, Tony did his own thing, he had more of a role on... Uh, uh, did, you, did you have more of a role on, on the Watch on the Run, or...? I think, I think on this, at this point, it gave me pretty much free reign to do what I wanted to do. So, I uh, went to heaven and made what the boss brings in. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to make it better than Jet Set Willie. Yeah. Trying to. Sounds pretty cool. Right. We got to Live Aid then. Because um, we can't leave 1985 right, I'm going to Live Aid, of course. Um, where we were? Yeah. My Nance Harris when this came on when this came on the TV the first time. But it moves on we're, we're, obviously the gaming industry got involved with Soft Aid, as we'll remember here. Um, after that they've Rod Cousins to the industry today as CEO of Codemasters. Um, he was in 1985 the head of Quicksilver and formed Soft Aid with a seal of approval from Duke Bob Geldof, supported by several major publishers in the software industry. Um, the cover the cassette um, was a little bit, I had came to some criticism, I believe, so because of the Ethiopian uh, child, but um, Rod was unrepentant, saying that um, what's happening in Ethiopia is very emotive and harrowing. I think it'd be very wrong to do anything else other than to promote what was on the inlay. That's the point we're putting across. So there we go, there's my way. There's a Tinderbox. So if you, any of you guys remember Tinderbox, Ian, Roman Graphics, I mean, you did your bit for, for this um, with, uh, with Tinderbox. Have you got any stories behind this at all? 
you can tell us a bit more about the game, how, how, how did the collaboration happen with you guys? Or? I'm trying to remember actually how that came about. Um, <laughs> I think it was, it was a couple of lo local people that uh, uh, were very interested. I think, if I remember rightly, they may have had something to do with uh, teaching, etc. And they came up with a, a concept for the product. Um, I don't remember much more about it, to be honest with you. Yeah, well, Sorry, <laughs> We all remember what we did in that year, back in the back in the eighties. I know I can't. <laughs> no, it, it, it wasn't a groundbreaking product. That's why. <laughs> that basically not just the, the stick in your mouth so much as the other product. No, no, no. It was uh, it was a, a minor product at the end of the day. Okay, fair enough. Um, well, for you guys who don't know, I mean, uh, Game of Dads, who I work for, we support a special effect, and so do you. Um, so to this day, you, can't, you um, I mean, you've done the anti-drugs off the hook compilation, 1986, for Princess Trust, and you also allowed Sheffield Hallam University Steel Minions recently um, to release Montemol and uh, a new Montemol Zoo game, and you, they might be doing Japanese later on this year. Is that right? Yeah, the work with um, Games Britannia. Um, ah yes, with yeah. Mark Hardesty, and uh, he yeah, uh, provided this part, 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 part. Right, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a great guy, Mark. Works very, very hard, um, and I, I allow them to use the the IPs that I still own um, to get the give the kids a kick start on uh, their game designs, etc. And then with um, with Jake at uh, Sheffield Hallam, he then gets his his students to create a product based on the winning school that came through with the best idea. That's a, that's a damn good idea, though. Yeah, strangely enough, the two years that it's been running, um, I think this will be the third year, um, both the teams that have won have both been teams of girls. Interesting. Yeah. Is that, are you finding that then, that uh, there's more uh, women and girls getting into, into coding and gaming in general now? Or? Uh, I, I don't know because I'm not so involved now, but uh, maybe, maybe Tony, not Pete, can I There's no one there. <laughs> yeah, we had one or two artists, and I, don't, I think I've seen one female programmer. Is that it? I can't remember, yeah. So, yeah, I've not seen lots of females in there. So, it's still predominantly male um, industry, then, really. Yeah. I, I, think one of the why, I think one of the reasons why the girls come through in, um, from a design point of view is that. They, they haven't got any preconceived ideas. They're not generally big gamers, yeah. but they, they like to think that they can come up with a creative concept. And uh, that's what's actually shone through in the two um, Games Britannia competitions. Yeah. I like it, it's because they don't like the funny hours we work. Yeah, there is that. <laughs> that's it, that's it. That's kind of huge. It's nice to see that there are some women getting into it, but like you say, it's definitely, is there anything you think you guys the industry could do to actually trap more women into it, do you think, or? You ever thought about it? <laughs> no, it's just a job, isn't it? It's just a job, isn't it? I mean, it's long hours. Well, I know. I'm a software tester myself, and you just, you just sat there staring at a screen for hours and hours and hours and hours, and hours and it just, yeah. yeah. But I'm doing things as well, I'm not just staring at it. Thinking oh, I'm not. What to do I'm, I'm staring blankly at it, and sometimes out the window, it's amazing. <laughs> okay, um, well, just so you guys know, we just the, what we've just been talking about there, all the, the um, proceeds from that do go to Game of Charity Special Defender all over the UK. I think that deserves a massive round of applause from everyone, to be honest. <laughs> and moving on, but do check out Special Effects as well when, when you get away from this. Um, definitely well worth uh, checking out. They're usually at the, uh, the stand here, but they're not here this year. We go to 986 then. Um, shiny New Year and a serious year for Gremlin because da -da, the new Gremlin logo. Out goes the cartoonish Gremlin figure and in comes a sparkling new logo. Clean cuts, sharp retained, and matching in Stuart's suits. <laughs> Gremlin is considered a rising star, one of the fast growing software houses in Britain. And for the first time, they take the stand at the Personal Computer World Show, which is a forum to get you a gamer, uh, for those who weren't aware. The stand would cost upwards of 10 grand, um, so they meant business. Um, and this year, a surprise parcel drops to the letterbox of the Gremlin offices from Derby. 
Ten points. There you go, Bounder. There we are. So, in Bounder, the, the player controls a tennis ball that has to bounce from rooftop to rooftop, picking up powers and um, avoiding enemies and hazards. Um, set by a group of friends, Rob Toon and the Green Terry Lloyd, uh, fronted by programmer uh, uh, Chris uh, uh, Shrigley, I think it's Shrigley? Shrigley, yeah. Um, uh, Chris, uh, I've got a quote from Chris here about, about Bounder. He said, uh, We actually sent Bounder to Ocean and Gremlin. Uh, Gremlin responded very quickly and invited us up to Sheffield for a visit and a chat. We all traipsed up there on the train and a bit of cold and slightly snowy day. He had offered to publish the game and offered us jobs straight away, and I don't think we've ever heard back from Ocean. Um, we contacted Gary Bracey for Ocean, he said he loved the title and he definitely would have grabbed it at the time had it come to his attention, but he insists that he never received the cassette. Um, from now, Chris, Rob, Andy and Terry would commute daily from Derby to Sheffield to work at Gremlin. Oh, another one, Footballer of the Year. Where he took the role of an upcoming striker in the football team, they end up scoring as many goals and finally winning that player's <laughs> pride. Um, it's sold over, I've got here about 400,000 units, does that sound about right? Quite a big seller for you this one, wasn't it? I'd probably take a note off that. Probably take a note off that. Oh, that, there you go, there's, there's, your, uh, there's your friend Mark. <laughs> so it's actually about 40,000 instead of 400. To be honest with you, I couldn't tell you, but it definitely wasn't 400,000. I'd remember that. <laughs> You'd be like, yes! Um, so, I mean, can you, can you remember where the Football of the Year um, concept and the game came from at all? It, 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 originated from, it originated from a board game from... Crikey, I'm trying to remember their names. A couple of brothers from Reading who brought a board game up to us and they had an idea of turning the board game that they designed into a computer game. I can't remember their names. No, I've not got their names on here, I'm afraid, so there's, no. there's research. But yeah, um, it's strange. I mean, we often, obviously, the, that, that morning, that I've that just mentioned, was sent in by members of the public. So, I mean, do, you, do we guys often send in sort of demo tapes of things from members of the public sort of for the big break? Or? Yeah, yeah, regularly. Regularly, there's stuff dropping through the letterbox. And it's, it's one of those situations you need to look at everything because you don't know what you might have missed. Yeah. So, and that's, that's the attitude that we took. Most of it wasn't, wasn't going to go anywhere, but uh, you know, generally it got, everything got looked at and there was an answer given to whoever had sent it in, encourage them or tell them to try something different. There you go, so, that was quite, so every single thing that went through your, your mailboxes then, they all got tried out? Yeah, yeah someone would have looked at it, yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. Is there any, any particular games like that that stand out for any of you guys? Any favourites that came from members of the public? I can remember one, but I can't remember where it was. It was a Swedish guy, a Sweden guy. It was a dragon flying around. That was brilliant. I can't remember where it was. Fabian or something. Like that. I can't remember. Did it get published? Or? I think he went to work for Gremlin later. I think he did work for. Not while I was there, but I'm sure. It's a dragon game. Oh, I know. Yes, we did see some games. Who did that? That might have been money. He might have toned other companies. <laughs> <laughs> On his fifth version of Susan. Oh, that's Karen's number. Another one, another one there. Yeah. I know there's a train in the new game I'm working on at the moment, and so many people keep coming up to me. Yeah. Not another train game. <laughs> How long did it take to code that? Can't say about the new one. <laughs> because the time was on, the, 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 the dev time for you guys will be going down from like uh, two weeks to a week to a day to three hours. To <laughs> uh, games take two, two, two years now. Yeah, they, they, they do take, they, they take quite a long time. Well, moving on to one of my favourites, uh, arcade games. Remember this one, Gauntlet, the four-player epic. Um, Ian and Kevin approached by Jeff Brown and sent us off to US Gold to come to Gremlin as managing director and help Gremlin grow. Um, so we've got a conversion of, of um, Gauntlet. Um, and Kevin Bulmer and Ben Dalgleish led the coding music duties. Um, Golden and Golden 2 went on to be huge hits for US Golden and Gremlin producing the expansion Deeper Dungeons in the Birmingham outfit. Um, Ian, was this one of the agreements or, or, or the benefits of Jeff Brown being MD at the time? Yeah, it was beneficial to him, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, US Gold as it was at the time, um, with licensing um, various, various products from coin-op manufacturers, etc. But they didn't have a a resource for 
um, doing any coding. So him joining the, the Browning board actually gave him the, the use of the facilities, and that's it's one of the things that enabled us to grow. Just like that collaboration between yeah. Any, any sort of things that stick in your mind from that from that era, working with USGOs, any, any stories, any tidbits that you got for the audience? Not that I would disclose, no. <laughs> Come on, little, give us something. No? Okay, fair enough. Uh, they, they, they were very good years. They were very good years. We did, we had a lot of fun during that time. So they're the sort of best years at the time? Or yeah, I think the, the, the industry had started to mature and uh, um, there was more money being made in the industry and it enabled you to have more fun. Um, you know, there was uh, there's silly stories that, uh, about how much money people were spending on things, mostly by American companies. I think Activision in their early days uh, um, were renowned for flying people around the world and having everybody picked up in limousines, etc. Didn't quite happen that way at Gremlin. <laughs> I bought my 10p bus ticket. <laughs> so it's sending down the... Sinclair yeah. C5. Well, that's true, yeah. Thank <laughs> you very much. Uh, <laughs> that, that, I don't remember that. The, um, there was a massive subway network in Sheffield at the time, wasn't there? It was sending around there. Brilliant stuff. Anyway, uh, moving on. Trailbrazer. Who remembers Trailbrazer? Yeah. yeah. So another surprise submission from Mr. Chip Software, this one. A uh, wonderful mix of racing game, 3D jump and run. Um, Mr. Chip Software was started in 1982 by Sean Scoffin and a certain Andrew Morris. Andrew, question for you finally, sorry. Yes. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Um, can you give us a bit of background about Mr. Chip? Um, have you been to that point? Is there any highs and lows? Uh, any, any stories around uh, well, your time? I joined Mr. Chip from school, so we had already started when I joined. Uh, and then I formed Magnetic Fields with Sean Southern. Um, so uh, I wasn't really involved with Mr. Chip for an awful long time. But not beside him there. Right, okay. Um, I mean, do you know anything about, about Trailblazer at all? Were you, uh, I think my, my sole contribution to it was the loading screen. So I worked on Cosmic Causeway, the sequel of the film, and a lot more involvement in that. But uh, it was basically just the loading screen. Uh, when that was developed, was, uh, it was around about when I joined Mr. Chip Software. Oh, right. Yeah. So it was like smack on when you. Yeah, when you that's came all, in. I just left school, and, and, and that, that was being developed at the time. Must have been quite a change for you. Did you, so you came straight from school straight in? Uh, I, I think I was on the dole for, for two or three months and then um, then I joined Mr. Chip Software and, and I sort of um, got on with it straight away. Um, yeah. I think I, I, within the first few weeks I designed the loading, loading screen on that. Very, very happy that I had some involvement in the game. Yeah. That would be, it's your first job. So, I mean, I think I've got any interest in this. God, yeah. There we are. The bleach boy wonder? No, that's not me. That's not you, is it? Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> that's Tony. Oh, yeah. This has come from uh, Mark's actually gave it uh, this morning on here. Um, so who's, who's, who's on this bit? Who, who's on this? So we've got on the, on the left, we've got, we've got Ben Dow Bleach. And obviously, um, Tony there, I've lost my uh, thing. So, um, Back where, uh, back, back with Tony, uh, not content with Bruce developing, found himself at Alligator and formed Weed Music with Ben Bagley. So there we go, that's Ben. Um, the Nomadic Developing to continue his wilderness years with Alligator, Quicksilver, Mac, uh, Mirasoft, and Mindscape, just to name a few. Um, Tony, um, I got his, there's a thing from uh, Zap who said um, that uh, Crowe's next game is much anticipated. Um, how how is everyone in, in the industry, in, in your store offices, coping with being the pressure sort of being software superstars at this time? Is there any, was there any sort of fights, any fallouts, any sort of any things that happened during the time that you'd like that you're happy to talk about here? No, as far as I know, I was a happy chum, me running around doing what I wanted to do, really, so I couldn't complain. You're happy so, with it, weren't yeah. you? And then were you aware of the pressure at the time, or? It didn't bother me because I always kept coming up with another game and it was always there, so it's not as if I dried up and nothing happened. So I could always say there'll be another game, it'd be better, because I'll try a bit harder. So I always just, you just keep moving on and moving on. I've never failed yet, I would say. It's a very scenario. 